having been disappointed, he told his advisors, this was no good, what shall I do? They said, you didn't give enough publicity, and this wasn't a uh, good enough feast, have a bigger feast, and hold it for seven days, and let all the people come, and send the messages out by beat of drum in all the villages and the remote cities, and then you'll find peace. So the king held a still bigger feast, and it was held for seven days. And all the yogis again came up, many wise ones also came up, they set up their camps and some wore clothes, some did not wear clothes, some wore orange colored clothes, all kinds of people came. And again the disputation started and they all discussed the merits and demerits of this god and that god and this method and that method and each one uh, proclaimed his method to be superior and none of them seemed to know why they were there. They had a lot of scholarship, had a lot of learning, they did not have the answer to the king's question. The king said, this is no good. I want to know the reality, true knowledge. And the advisor said, king, if you want the true knowledge, you won't get it by your feet. And that man won't come to your feet. There is a man. He is a real mystic. He sits on the bank of the river. And his name is Ashtabak. That mystic's name was Ashtabak. He has a hunchback. Not good in it and attractive, so attractive in appearance. He has a glow in his face, all right. But uh, otherwise, there's nothing much in him, and he doesn't come to you. You have to go to him. If you want to find knowledge, you go to him. The king, having spent all his lifetime in the search for knowledge, was quite willing to pay the price for it. So the king made the journey with his retinue, and he reached uh, the bank of the river, and there met Ashtabak. He was sitting in his hut, small hut, with a few of his disciples in front of him. They had taken off their shoes outside the hut, and they were sitting on the floor in front of him. And when the king entered, Ashtabakar said, King, I see you have come here. He said, Yes, Ashtabakar, I have come as a seeker. I want knowledge. But I don't want the kind of knowledge which people offer where you do meditation for this life and you get knowledge in the next. I don't want to spend 20 years on meditation, not even two. I want instant knowledge. That is the first American version I heard. <laughs> so the king said, uh, I want instant knowledge. Give it to me right now, across the counter. And Ashtabakar said, How much time will you give me to give you the knowledge? He says, I can give you as much time as I take to mount my seat, to mount my horse. Whatever time I take to jump up on my horse, that much time you take to give me the instant knowledge. He said, All right, you pay me the price, and I'll give you the knowledge. It's a deal. He said, Sure, you name the price, I'll give it. He said, I only want three things. You give me these three things, I'll give you the instant knowledge that you want. He said, okay, that's the deal. You name the three things and I want the instant knowledge right now. He said, all right, uh, King Janak, you give me these three things. You give me your body, you give me your wealth, and you give me your mind. And I give you instant knowledge. Now, these were uh, strange terms for a deal, but the king was in search for this for so long. And he said, all right, I accept. Then uh, Ashtabakar said, King Janak, this body you have given to me. So now set this body out on the shoes for the disciples outside. That was now the king sat there while his advisors, they all looked what happened to the king. And the king also thought this was very funny. I am the king with all those palaces and all those jewels and whatnot that I possess, and here I am sitting on the shoes of these people. And Ashtabakar said, King, you have given those jewels and palaces to me. You have no business to think of them as yours. <laughs> and Ashtabakar realized, yes, I have given my wealth away to him also. And he said, I have no business to think of those things. It's absolutely funny. I shouldn't have thought of those things now. And he thought in these terms. And Ashtabakar said, King, you have no business to think at all. You have given your mind also to me. And when he realized that he had given the mind and the capacity to think also to the to the Ashtabakar, he just put his hands like this and said, oh, and he cried out. At that stage, Ashtabakar gave him that special grace of the Lord. And he had, of course, done a lot of work earlier for the last 20 years. That he got a flash, of one flip, flipped flash of knowledge of the essence. And then, of course, he got up at once. And Ashtabakar said, King Janak, have you got the true knowledge? He said, yes, sir. Are you sure? He said, I am absolutely sure. He said, any questions? He said, I have no questions. 
he said, uh, did it take as long as you said? And said it took less. So that is how he got instant knowledge. But there, the, the king had made a preparation and he was willing to do that which uh, he had been trying to do for a long time. Now really, that instant knowledge, that awareness that what he had was real and true and free from doubt came from the wakefulness that he was in. It did not come uh, because of any extraordinary scene he saw. He suddenly awoke. It's just like us. When we wake from a dream, we don't wake up in stages. Either we are dreaming and then suddenly we are awake. We don't open our eyes and watch our and see that the room is the same. We lie in bed in which we have slept. We are dreaming there. And then suddenly when we are awake, we know we are awake with our eyes closed, reclined, with the, with the blanket on, exactly in the same position as we were dreaming. In that clash, we know we are awake. And that wakefulness carries its own certainty with it. You don't ask anyone, am I awake? Am I sure if I am awake? Never. Because the level of consciousness has been slipped up. And we know at once that this is wakefulness as a thing from dream. And the corroboration to that is provided by the instant return of the memory of the state in which we were before we went to sleep. That is the corroboration. And that comes instantly. The moment we wake up, we know that we had gone to sleep. It is this memory of the fact we had gone to sleep that makes it certain, a doubtless knowledge that we were dreaming in our awake. If we did not remember that we were awake last time and then at that time we had gone to sleep, there would still be doubt. But the fact that we knew we are awake, then we went to dream and then got up and that return of memory of our previous state of wakefulness gives us instant knowledge having got up. In the same way, this flip up that takes place through meditation is not merely a discovery of a new world. It is a discovery of the old world. It is not the opening up of a new life. It is the coming back into the life from which you flip into the dream. It is your life. It is the one you are accustomed to for much longer than this one. It is a much longer life. You know it much better than you know this. The relationships with the projection which you have created at that level are much more real than these relations. These, these just uh, tear up like a dream when you wake up. Therefore, this really becomes instant knowledge uh, even, uh, even in meditative state. But like the king had to put in so much work for 20 years before he got instant knowledge. The example is given of the man who is digging a tunnel. In a mountain. Goes on digging the tunnel, goes on digging the tunnel and says, There is no light. It's only when the last part falls and he says, There is light. Now he hasn't got dug the tunnel in one stroke, in one blow. He has seen the light in one blow. But to see the light in one blow at the end of the tunnel, you have to take the whole tunnel in darkness. That is why very often we feel we have been digging the tunnel and trying to hit and hit and hit and it doesn't seem to give the light. When the light comes, although the light comes in a flash, without time, instant. It is not as a result of that instant, it is a result of all the digging that we have done. You will be surprised that we have been doing this digging for a long time. Some of us, even before we came on the orange path, some of us have done it for thousands of years. In several forms of our consciousness, this digging has not been a recent affair. That search for finding what is inside this consciousness has not been a recent one. If it were recent, we wouldn't understand. We wouldn't go near it. We'd say, oh, that's nothing. That's all tall talk. We just won't go near it. The fact we are willing to not only go near it, but experiment with it, shows there has been a search inside of us going on for a long time. And that is the long process of digging the tunnel. Now we are only getting close to the end. We're getting a little disappointed, a little frustrated that after all we have dug so much, we've done so much, what have we got? But then digging of all tunnels gives that experience. It's only one who has earlier dug a tunnel and gone to the other side who can say, keep it up. <laughs> the other chap will say, well, I think I give up. I don't know how long, the, how big the mountain is. Therefore, it is necessary to have a master 
who has himself done that, which we are trying to do, and then get on to the other side. I'll come back to your question. You please ask your question again. The end out of that tunnel, so that we can see the light. Faster using the two parts of meditation or the one part of meditation, which the real question is the the real importance of the second part of the meditation, the bhajan, in conjunction with the simran. Master has said that the bhajan actually eliminates the karma, but the simran is necessary to get collected so that you're there to be eliminated. So the karma is there. You know, it depends which mountain you are digging. Supposing you're digging the mountain of distractions by thoughts. Words are very very important. Supposing you are digging the uh, mountain of disbelief, but not distraction by thought, sound is very important. These are two different things. Supposing your uh, progress in inward realization is being halted by the various thoughts that come into your mind, you won't hear the sound in any case till you have used the repetition of words for a considerable period. That is why the repetition of words is generally Especially for for this kind of a group, we are used to intellectualizing everything. Most of us are. We want to have intellectual satisfaction before we can go on. We want to have at least enough intellectual satisfaction to consider the process worthwhile. In this state, it is necessary to block these thoughts with words before we can hear the sound at all. That is why, in, in the case of most of us, words are more important to start with, but they will not take you very far. When they take you to the stage when you can hear the sound, the sound is much faster. That takes you much faster. That's the real secret. And beyond the second stage, it's only the sound, not the words at all. What about hearing the sound before you get to the first stage? Yes. <laughs> Those are only practice sounds. You know there are ten superficial sounds which you can hear within you by just a little withdrawal of attention. And those ten sounds are not the sounds that have the power to pull you into the next level of consciousness. But we give a certain amount of time. To yes, that for practice. As I said, these are practice sounds. These sounds are practice sounds, and they are not the shabad that we talk of. They are not the word. The lowest manifestation of what we call the word, the sound which rings from the inmost core of consciousness, which is the word. The lowest manifest form of that is in the form of the big. Sound of the bell, dong dong, that pulls you up, and that is ringing all the time, but you can't hear it because we are so much scattering our attention below that we are not anywhere near our own self. The sound is not coming from anywhere else; it's coming from right within ourselves, the inmost part of ourselves. But because we are completely away from the self on the screen, we are too much atten uh, attentive to the white screen around us. Therefore, we don't hear it when we start. We're drawing a little bit. We haven't gone anywhere near that. We come to the peripheral area, just around that, where we hear the practice sounds. These practice sounds are to enable our mental ear to hear. Just as for repetition of words, our mental uh, ear has to hear. You know, he was just raising a question about uh, this part coming into the repetition. Actually, this part will not come into repetition at all after a little practice. The mind will start repeating as it has been repeating. After a while, if you contemplate, even if now you contemplate, some of you have been doing this. Others may not be able to understand this. Those who have been doing this meditation will realize that with the mind, we never speak any words. We always listen. You'll be surprised. It is true that with our mind, we never speak any words. With the mind, we just listen. Something else seems to be speaking. What that mechanics is is difficult to explain, but it's there. And after a while, with practiced meditation, we just sit, relax, and listen to the words. Our mental ear listens to the words as much as to the shabad. Process is the same. For any higher ascent, the process is that of listening while sitting behind the eyes at the third eye center. But so long as words and thoughts disturb us, repetition of words is far more important. When you can get onto the sound, that is far more important. In the beginning, you must practice both. And the formula given for beginners is: well, you give three fourths of the time to words, one fourth to sound to start. These are both for practice. This formula is for practice. Once you begin to get in, you will automatically know what is better for you. And when you get onto the bell sound, 
the real big bell sound, there's no other solution required. Just hold on to that. It pulls you up at once, wakes you, wakes you, wakes at once, and changes itself as it wakes and becomes a living entity. You know that. How this bell sound, starting from a sound, when it begins to wake you up, pull you up, it becomes a power, and when you begin to feel you are in that power and you are awake and you can see all that I have been talking about today, and you can see with your own perception, then it becomes an entity and can talk to you, converse with you, be your friend. It's sound. It's no sound then. We call it a sound because in the, at that area where we can catch it, it is like a sound. It is like the sound of a bell. Since it can be identified in its resemblance with the sound of the bell, we call it a sound. But when it catches up, it wakes us up, it no longer remains a sound. And we discover that the master, that projected image, which we here thought was our teacher, the master, is the same image for the sound. And that sound was the master. In fact, it was there. It was from there that he got the projection and saw him outside here. Because we wouldn't believe this projection, therefore we had to take this as master. And then we withdrew. We found that the master always lay within us, never outside. That the master was always inside of us. And it was in that form. So this realization comes when the sound has picked you up to the next higher level of consciousness. When the real sound is heard, which is called the word, and the lowest form of that real sound is the big bell. That is why we find bells all over the world. Nobody has given thought to this, I am surprised. Why we ring bells in churches, bells in temples, bells everywhere. Wherever the name of God is taken, we ring bells. Why? Nobody has thought of it. And why we make the temple, the church, the mosque, everything like the head and ring the bell inside and never open up this and see that is it ringing here or not? And it's ringing all the time, 24 hours in each one of us. No exception. And I'll tell you the story of no exception by reminding you of, uh, by reminding you of uh, one disciple of the great master whose name was Shadi. Some of you might have heard that story and I might have told you eight years ago when I came. He was a, uh, a robber, a, a gangster who wielded his gun and went and looted people. And he heard that in the Dera at Pyas, the people are collecting a lot of gold to put on a new temple they're going to fix up. And on top of it, they'll plate it with gold. And therefore, a lot of uh, the devotees and disciples of the master there, one, one gentleman with a beard who's a master, he's collecting a lot of this gold. He'll put it on a temple. He said, that's a good place for me to go to. So he, he went on a recce trip, on a reconnaissance trip, to see where the gold lay, how he could uh, plan his uh, robbery and take the gold. So when he went, the satsang was on. The great master was giving his discourse. He didn't go to the discourse. He went inside the residential area of the Dera, which is a small one at that time, very small in fact, just a few houses. And he tried to find out where the gold was stored and put some questions to a few people who were there and saw what kind of arrangements for watch and ward were there and knew he had a good plan for taking hold of at least part of the gold. So having made his plan, he came out from the other side and just at the back of the open area where the discourse was going on, he passed by. When he passed, he just stopped to look what was being said in the discourse. At that very moment, the great master was saying, that word, that sound is resounding in everyone, in robbers, gangsters, <laughs> and saints. That in saints and robbers, gangsters and everybody it is resounding. And this chap heard, he said, he's talking to me. <laughs> and then uh, later on, of course, he went to the great master after the discourse and said, I came to rob you, but you robbed me. I came to take the gold away, but I have come to stay now. And he stayed on. So the great master said, you must do something useful. He said, but I know nothing else except how to rob. So what, what else will I do? So the great master said, do you know anything by way of some mechanics, something? He said, yes, yes. When I was young, I learned how to make these electric uh, dynamos and electric generators. At that time, there was no electricity in the Dera. So the great master said, you could set one up here. He said, yes, that'll be good. And I'll repair your machines and do some work for you, some seva. So he stayed in the Dera. He was the one who laid on the first generator and provided one single uh, illuminated bulb in the great master's house. That was his first contribution. And he stayed on till the end. He made rapid progress in spite of his background. And he made, made contacts with all the various uh, prophets and others who had, raised, uh, who had reached various levels, higher levels of consciousness. Described them. 
not only to the master with whom he was internally in touch but with the master's permission to others outsiders like myself with the master's permission and so we could see how much ascent that man made in spite of that background and the great master said it is not the background that matters because these backgrounds of experience come because of a set of uh, impressions on our minds it is just like a dream sequence when we go to sleep the fact we have had a bad dream does not make us bad certainly not for all time it is that particular set of impressions which you carried which gave a bad dream which were bad it can be followed by good our life is a combination of several kinds of impressions which the mind carries several kinds of karma or sanskar or mental impressions which we carry and it is the the reaction to those impressions that gives rise to this better dream which we call wakefulness and sometimes we say we like to be good all of us like to be good but we turn out to be bad sometimes for a year or two we are very bad we don't know why we don't want to be bad yet we are bad and for certain periods we are very good <laughs> and we don't know how what has happened to us sometimes we are very ill in terrible state sometimes we are in very good health and we don't know how this combination of black and white has been made out of this pattern of one lifetime which is fed into this good computer in advance like a punch card and it works itself out contains several patches of different shades of black and white and grays and these are the shades which give rise to all these different kinds of feelings the discovery of a master the discovery of the seeking in your heart and thereby thereafter a master thereafter initiation thereafter opening up the aspect these are very very white bright spots in that pattern but it does not mean that once these white spots start you cannot have dark spots because at least for this lifetime the dark and white spots have been fed into the machine in advance therefore you find some people who have uh, suddenly got a lot of illumination turning quite dull later on and having no light for a certain period and coming back to it later on this is called pralabad pralabad means the destiny the fate we have brought fate is nothing more than this preset punched card that has been fed into this computer and which is now working itself out in time and it is this that gives rise to these kinds of so called uh, anomalies we try to apply the law of evolution to spiritual growth the law of evolution can be applied to the growth of awareness it cannot be applied to the events of life the events of life as they come in the drama around us are according to the preset pattern but the awareness of that what is going on that is being evolved in stages as you will find with every one of the black spots the, ev the evolution of awareness goes up whereas in the first black patch dark patch in our life we were miserable terrible in the second dark patch we were not so terrible the third dark patch the patch will be even darker others may say he is suffering so much our mental awareness shows we are not so bad off so the level of awareness which is growing that is evolving all the time but the patches keep on the same way dark and white that is how life is constituted therefore to answer your question in a brief way i would say that uh, to for a beginner who who has no understanding of what will take him up faster he should give more time to repetition of words less time to the hearing of the sound current when he gets onto the sound current he should give more time to the sound current and less to the words till he gets on real well to the bell sound in which case he need bother of bother with nothing else except the bells that sound will take him up Welcome. That's right. That's right. You are not personally involved, and therefore you are less affected by them. That is the whole uh, idea. That you should be able to develop what has been called detachment. What is true detachment? Detachment is not merely from A or B or X or Y, or Y for son or daughter or father or mother. Detachment means. detachment from experience as a whole so when you develop attachment with the inner sound with the master in his real form when you develop attachment with all that is there inside with meditation to see you automatically develop detachment outside and with this detachment they don't affect you so much ultimately they become part of the drama and you can sit in the chair 
like you sit in a movie hall and watch the drama on the screen when something wrong goes up you don't jump up from your seat and go there you still relax and see that's the kind of way a person who has developed a detachment would look at life including himself and his own part in it he would just relax in his cushioned seat here watch the drama of life and not jump up in his seat if something goes wrong because it's all happening on the screen he just keeps on sitting on his uh, on his uh, chair and watches as it goes on i have no idea i am not an expert in the bible or in any other text or book yes sir. <laughs> yes <laughs> because of the word but before when you use the word uh, me that's right it could it could i am saying that detachment will help that if you are detached from the external experience does help but there is one thing to be careful about detachment and that is a lot of people try to detach thinking that detachment is a self contained process some people say if i take my attention off i'll get detached this has never worked like you like you can never stop the thought stream from your mind you can never develop detachment like that in fact the mind is so tricky that when you want to force it away and say you don't detach yourself there you would get detached it thinks more and more of that the more you pull the mind away from a thing the more it comes back there therefore people who have tried detachment have failed there's another uh, technique for detachment which always works and that is attach to something else when you attach to something else you automatically detach here there it always works you give a toy to a child to play with and he's playing you call him a fool the mother says come along very come along Betty is not even listening to the mother. She's so much engrossed in the toy. You give another toy that Betty throws away the first one. It's the same thing. We are all Bettys in different ways. We are not willing. We are not willing to give our attention from the experiences around us till something more attractive, something more drawing, becomes available to us. That is why this little inducement of better scenes at the higher level of consciousness, which induces us. to get on there and once we get on there we automatically detach that is true detachment we can't pull away it's only by attaching there that we can get detachment here that only he could expound my understanding is that he comes to all who have been initiated by him without exception that is my understanding and if he says that he will not come to some who will break the law he is just making you not break the law
the statement that you have uh, just uh, quoted was made in that context of seeing that people who hear him awake. That is his object. And his object is not to state the whole truth. In fact, he doesn't state much. <laughs> he, states, he states as much as enables people just to get on to the uh, two and a half hours. <laughs> his object is to uh, uh, let people wake and see for themselves. Yeah, let me now come back to this because you raised it twice. It's a question of guilt. So I think I should come back to it. Uh, the concept of guilt or good and evil or ethics or morality arises from the concept of free will. You can't feel guilty if you knew you can do nothing. If a person knew that there's nothing in his hands, he would never be able to feel guilty. A real satsangi is one who has surrendered everything to the master. He can never feel guilty. If he still feels guilty, he's not a real satsangi. To that extent, it is quite right to say that a real satsangi should never feel guilty. Of course, if he is not a real satsangi, but tries to be one, and tries to understand, in fact, I have no powers. I can do nothing. And we talked of free will yesterday. And I said how the mind experiences so-called apparent free will in reality having none. The reality of this is intellectually grasped. There can be no possible guilt because you cannot be punished for that which you are not doing. The whole law of karma is based on this ignorance of the reality. The law of karma is based on the apparent exercise of free will. Therefore, I often call it the apparent law of karma. There is no real law of karma. Above the second stage, there is no law of karma. The whole law of karma, which is inviolate, it must work. Work only in the first two stages. It does not work beyond. There is no law of karma. Karma or the business of action and reaction or the business of reward and punishment for good and bad actions. This business operates in time and space. It cannot operate beyond that. It must operate where there is cause and effect. Therefore, it operates only at this level and no, no more. A true satsangi cannot confine his understanding of the path to this day. Therefore, he can never feel guilty. Everything happens by his will. And everything he does is directed towards fulfilling his will. Therefore, the question of guilt never arises. Yes, sure. In that case, you must perform the duty. Incidentally, this path has never suggested at any stage the non-performance of any duty, even according to the accepted codes of conduct of this world. In fact, this path requires that whatever is the accepted duty according to accepted codes of the society you live in, perform that. It's part of this uh, path. Nothing to do with this path. Yes. You are supposed to earn, you earn. You are supposed to go to the doctor to get medicine, get the doctor, uh, go to the doctor for medicine. You are supposed to support your children, support your children. You are supposed to be responsible for certain actions because of the uh, occupation in life. Fulfill that responsibility. In fact, if you don't do all these things, then you are not fulfilling part of the program laid on for this path. This path requires that as a concomitant, you should fulfill all the other responsibilities. Arising from the environment created around you. Sure. Yes. A soldier must participate actively in war. Yes, to be a soldier. It depends. If you are uh, under conscription and called up, don't run away. No, that is the law. The point is simple. That you have been placed in a certain environment and certain duties are being cast on you because of where you are. Fulfill them. We are talking of the environment and not of the higher program. <laughs> the higher program has several kinds of punch cards and many of those punch cards are of those who did not fulfill their duty. And many of those are of uh, punch cards of those who did not make any progress. And many of the punch cards are of those who never saw any reality. We are not talking of that. We are talking of one who is going to make progress on this path. His punch card shows that he fulfills the duty 
arising from the environment which is placed. Otherwise, of course, everything is predetermined. But in such case, it will also be predetermined, he won't get anything. We are not talking of that instance. There are such instances. In fact, the majority of instances are such. The majority of punched cards available in the second stage, from where they are fed, are of those who do not perform their duties. But we are not referring to that. We are talking of the group that is getting the best out of this part. And that group performs its duty. Does it answer your question? You, yes, yes, go. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you put this question. Oh, I'm glad you put this question. I'm glad you put this question because it raises a basic issue as what is karma? You have, in fact, raised a very basic issue. No. Last time I was here, I, uh, I spoke in Detroit, Michigan. And at the end of the talk, one lady walked up to me and she says, May I shake your hand? Will it not add to your karma? And I said, Are you sure it will not wear off the previous karma? When you say you go to war and kill a man, how are you so sure that you are not fulfilling the previous karma and creating new one? After all, karma is a two-way traffic. It is not merely creating new impressions. It is wearing off the old ones. What makes you feel that this particular karma is the old one or the new one? I'll give you the answer. How to distinguish between the old one and the new one. There are two kinds of karma. In fact, three. But we'll immediately be concerned with two. You heard of that. Uh, Pralabad, Karaman, Sijjan. Which means destiny through which we have to pass. Fresh actions. Deliberative actions, which we are now performing, and the reservoir of karma, which has not come into this life. These are the three kinds of karma or mental impressions, which constitute the fabric of life. Now, sinchit or reservoir has not come into this life, so it doesn't play any significant part here. So we'll forget about it. The other two, pralabad or fate karma, and uh, kareman or deliberative action, plays an important when a man joins war and kills another man, he has to find out whether he is doing one or the other. The distinction is in the deliberative part. Is his action deliberative or non-deliberative? If the action has taken place without giving you a choice, a choice which was open for some time, in which your mind went over the alternatives open and then took one, it is problem or destiny. If you got the choice and you exercise the choice by going through the merits and demerits of the alternatives, should I do this, should I not do this? If I do this, this will happen. If I don't do this, this will happen. And then you go into it, it is karema or fresh karema. You will find this process of deliberation. I, yes, I'll explain it. I'll, I'll go over it again. There are two kinds of actions. One is the action which is the, itself the reaction of a previous action. And one is an action to which there will be a reaction in the future. Now, we can't avoid actions which are themselves the reaction of a previous action. And we needn't bother. In fact, if they come, it's good. Even if it's killing of a man. Because that man killed us. And therefore, we were destined to kill him. It is so written in the law. We couldn't get out of it. But if we now kill a man deliberately, then maybe he'll come to kill us later and punish us. How to distinguish between these two kinds of killings or these two kinds of karma? That's the point here. And I am making the point that in the first kind, where it is a reaction of a previous karma, there is no opportunity given to our process of selection to make a choice between alternatives. It just happens. In the case of the second one, an opportunity for selection is given to us. Time is given to us to make a selection. We go in our mind through the process of choosing between alternatives, this or that, this or that, then we choose. That is a new action to which there will be reaction. So the difference is whether it was a truly deliberative action or a non-deliberative action. There is only one word of caution here. To some of the actions which are pralabad actions or destiny actions or actions which are reactions to previous actions, where no deliberation has taken place when the action took place, but there has been deliberation thereafter. And in retrospect, we say, I could have avoided that. That does not change the destiny karma. It still remains destiny karma. That's right. That's the difference. Exactly. When you have no choice, 
and the choice is arising after the action. It is reaping. When you have choice and time has been given to choose and you have applied your mind to the alternatives available, that is fine. That's the difference. Look at your life. I look at mine. Everyone who has raised this question, I have asked him to be practical and look at the events of his life. Where did he have a choice? And most of the time you find where you thought you had a choice, you had a choice after the event. After it has happened, you say, I could have done that and I could have done that. Not when you did it. It's a very strange thing, but that's how it happens. We think we had a choice all the time. This is the nature of mind. The nature of mind is to say, we had choice all the time. But when the events come, either circumstances, force of circumstances, force of our own mind, it blanks out. When you are going through a pralabhat karma, and the karma is such that normally you would have had a choice, at that moment, the selective mechanism blanks out. You go through it and you say, ah, what happened to me? I could have done the other thing. You say it afterwards. It still remains destiny karma. Yes, everything else involved except deliberation. Yes. This, this is the whole disting, distinguishing mark. The distinguishing mark between the karaman and the pralabhat is the deliberation. That is what really comes out. And in deliberation, it is not left in, a, uh, left in such a weak uh, definition that it may be this or maybe that. There is no such karma. I haven't come across that anyway. Whereas you are left so weakly on the margin, this may be marginally this or that. There is no such thing. You are given very clear opportunity for deliberation in a new karma. And you know it when it comes because before the karma, so much thought has gone into it. So much free will has gone into it, so-called free will. That is what, that's what entitles you to the reward or the punishment. If that free will had not gone into it, how can you be punished or rewarded for it? If by accident you are, you are doing things, by the accident of situation, the accident of birth, the accident of circumstances, how can you be punished or rewarded? In fact, that is the punishment and reward, what is happening. But when you have been given the so-called choice, so-called free will to do this or that, then you exercise it, not merely have an abstract choice. When you actually exercise it, it's a new karma. Provided, provided you allow master to let it down. You see, most of the time, the master is willing to do everything for us, but we don't accept it. Our minds, doesn't, our minds don't accept it. The master is willing to do every possible thing, not on the spiritual progress, for everything that we have to do while we are in this living frame. This world, that world, everything. Every bit, every moment he is willing to do for us. We let him do it. We don't let him. Why not? There is a, there is, <laughs> whoever doesn't should ask himself. Whoever doesn't should ask himself why. But the reason being, we don't have faith. We don't believe. We say we believe, but we don't believe. We want to believe, but we don't believe. We want to persuade ourselves that we are believers, but we are not believers. That's the real answer. And this belief comes when we have seen something. And that something to be seen comes when we have believed. We don't get out of this vicious circle. Yes, but when it comes, then we are willing to believe and willing to leave to the mother. We normally say, these things I can understand. They are very clear to me. I'll take care of them, master. But these are difficult I can't understand. Master, you take care of them. You're carrying this in your pocket. <laughs> the coming of grace, also, uh, faith also partially a matter of man's grace. It is. Granting us experiences that will strengthen our faith. It is. When you have faith and you're willing to leave to the master, then of course he fashions your life in the way in which you mention. But when you don't have it, then we struggle ourselves. There is a Muslim mystic by the name of Maulana Rum. Rumi. Some of you might have heard his name. He's written beautiful poems, short poems in a particular form called the Masnavi. In one of those poems, he described the story of a small child who's fighting with another one. And the father of the child is watching. And when the child boxes the other one and this father says, yeah, go ahead, that's good. While the child thinks he can fight it out, the father doesn't interfere. Only when he can't fight it out and runs, the father picks him up and says, okay, I'll take care of you. Then uh, uh, Malana Room says, this is our situation. We wait for the father to pick us up, but while we fight, thinking we can do it, he doesn't bother, he watches. But when we turn around to him, you pick us up, he picks us up. 
we are not willing to turn around to him. We are willing to turn around to him for those things which we can't see. Others we say, oh, that's clear to us, that I'll manage. My job I'll manage, this I'll manage, this particular job I'll do, that's easy, income tax I'll take care of, all that. But, but this problem has come up, master, you manage for me now. This kind of divided surrender makes uh, for all the troubles. How can you, how, can you give us a tip on how to surrender completely? It's a big problem. How do you just surrender like the Lord? <laughs> That's a good question. I'll try and answer that one. How one can surrender completely? Uh, there is another poem which I'm reminded of, which describes the stages of surrender. It says, uh, one of the uh, disciples is reciting, it's a Persian poem, in which he says, I, when I experienced surrender, I found that I surrendered this world. I found I surrendered this body. I found I surrendered my mind. I found I surrendered the surrenderer. The last part was the most significant. What is the basis for this uh, system of surrender? It is the ego. It is the human ego. So long as the human ego, individuated human ego, considers that that is the I, the question of surrender does not arise. True surrender can come when the human ego is surrendered. That's the hardest thing in the world to do, brother. I'll tell you. Goes, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. The, uh, the wrong way of doing it is to say, I surrender. If a person says, I surrender this or I surrender that, he is not actually practicing surrender. Because the real surrender, which matters here, is the surrender of the I. So long as I surrender this and I surrender that goes on, the I continues, which is the thing to be surrendered. So therefore, that surrender doesn't work. In fact, very often, it can do the opposite. It can give the feeling, I am a good satsangi, I have surrendered that. So I becomes more important. The ego, which stands in the way of realization, can sometimes create a problem. It's like uh, saying, I am humble. I am the humblest of the humble. I know nothing. I am nothing. And saying so, one thinks, now oh, I have developed some humility. Knowing, <laughs> knowing that humility is a recognized good quality, to go on saying I am humble is really raising, pumping up your ego. It's not reducing it. It's a, it's a trap of the mind. Similarly, surrender. Therefore, how does one surrender? How does one lose the I? One can surrender by not giving any part of your attention to the I, but giving the whole of it to the Him. Love, that's the answer. And what is love? With love, the same problem will come up. Whether you call it uh, surrender or you call it love, the same problem will come up. If you say, I love Him, I love the Master, I love God, you are really loving yourself. You are loving, your, loving the I. You see, when you love anyone, even in this world, you love X. Then X fills your mind so much, there is no time for you to think of I loving X. In fact, people who are really in love never think of I loving X. And when somebody says, I love you, you can be quite sure there's something wrong. <laughs> See, the person who is really in love, person who is really in love, is so much full of you in his or her imagination, her thoughts, her feelings. There is no time to think of the lover. All the time, all the available attention is taken up by the beloved. Therefore, a person who is in love with the master or with God would be so full of the master and God in his consciousness that there would be no time for him even to say, I love the master. Because he is, that is surrender. That is also love. Then there is nothing else to be done because the master is taking care of everything. When your attention can be fixed on the master in this way, then you are surrendering. And you are also loving. Now, how to fix the attention like that? The master gives an answer. See, everything is simplified on this path, as you know. As you must have noticed, there is a simplified mechanics for doing anything. Nothing is left as a philosophy. It's a practical path. How do we uh, identify ourselves with the master in such a way that we can say we love the master? How can we become uh, virtually one with the master? The master says, you can do that with your nijman, the inner mind. 
we all possess an inner mind. And the master in his discourses, in many of the discourses I've heard in the Dera, he's very beautifully given this example of a mother who is cooking at the cooking uh, uh, oh, uh, oven or stove. She's cooking there. Her eyes are on the food, on the plate, on the dough she's making and all the things she's handling. A child is playing out there and her inner mind is on the child. She doesn't look at the child. She doesn't speak about the child. She doesn't even uh, consciously think of the child. She thinks of the recipe before her, of the food she is cooking. But an inner mind of hers is on the child. And she knows the child makes a little sound. She leaves that and rushes and picks up the child. That is fixing of the inner attention or nijman on the child. The master says, if you can at all times fix your inner mind or inner attention on the master, and put your outer things on all the worldly work you do, you will have surrendered and also fallen in love with the master. Now this inner mind, this inner attention can be developed, provided we know what it is. And this mother's example is good. It, it shows you how you can keep that in the thought, in the back of your mind, that coming up all the time. You visualize what would be happening, what could happen, where did you last see, what happened then, all the old pictures, the new possible pictures, in different situations. When you, when you are in love, that is what you do actually. Why do you discriminate between the love here and there? When one is in love here and one has had some sampling of it, each one of us has had. You know that the mind gets filled up with the various events that have constituted the experiences of love. All those scenes keep on floating at the back of the mind. We keep on doing other things in front of us. That inner mind or the inner attention remains fixed on the object of love. That is the way in which the inner mind should be kept steadily on the master and you have loved as well as surrendered. Yes. Yes, it does. It does. That is the object of satsang. That is the object of satsang. Satsang means when a number of people on this path gather together and an atmosphere is created with this kind of a feeling of the inner mind being there comes up. The satsang has been successful. It's not how much intellectual knowledge we have exchanged. That doesn't matter. But if that feeling of inspiration, that feeling of going within, that feeling of being where we are, that begins to grow, the satsang has been successful. And that is what happens with all successful satsang. You know that. Any other question? No question. Thank you very much, Radha Swami.